Hello, a blazing sun, endless sands, and mega projects worth billions of dollars. Saudi Arabia is a country that generates grand projects of varying feasibility. Here, the kilometer-high Jeddah Tower is under construction, and the already famous megacity, the Line, the size of a small nation, is taking shape. But behind this impressive picture lies a troubling truth. The country is on the brink of a water crisis. In the desert, water is the most precious resource, and despite enormous oil revenues, the kingdom has yet to solve its water problem. With no rivers, an arid climate, and rapidly depleting underground reserves, the nation faces the threat of total water scarcity. Deserts and semi-deserts cover 95% of Saudi Arabia's territory, and it is here that an idea, more like science fiction than reality, is born to build a gigantic underground river longer than both the Amazon and the Nile. But why hide water beneath the ground when it is so desperately needed on the surface? The answer is far more fascinating than it might seem. Let's begin with an astonishing fact. In Saudi Arabia, the country that built an underground river, there isn't a single natural river. Yet, as of 2021, the kingdom had constructed 522 dams. This raises an obvious question. Why? After all, a dam is typically built to block a natural river, creating a reservoir where water accumulates and can then be distributed through various systems to people, agriculture, and industry. Yes, in Saudi Arabia, with a population of more than 35 million, there are no rivers. But there are wadis. These are large valleys, such as Wadi al Ruma, which usually remain dry and look no different from the surrounding arid desert until rainfall arrives. Looking at the precipitation map, it may seem unlikely that just a few dozen millimeters falling from the sky could make any difference in the country's water supply. However, during the rainy season, the amount of rainfall is significant enough to provide water for large cities. Altogether, the storage capacity of the nation's reservoirs reaches 2.3 billion cubic meters. For example, in the Mecca region alone, 60 dams have been built with a combined storage of 880 million cubic meters. Among them is the Khalis Dam, standing 95 meters tall and stretching 384 meters in length. The resulting reservoir holds nearly 250 million cubic meters of water, making it the second largest dam in Saudi Arabia. In the Asir administrative region, 118 dams have been constructed, capable of storing up to 520 million cubic meters of water. In total, the reservoirs formed by dams provide Saudi Arabia with about 1.6 billion cubic meters of drinking water annually. Of course, this is not the kingdom's only source of water. The most important ones are the underground lakes, and here is their map. Fortunately for the Saudis, nature did not leave them entirely without water. It lies right beneath their feet. According to various estimates, Saudi Arabia's underground reserves contain between 259 and 761 billion cubic meters of water. However, this fact still does not spare the kingdom from water scarcity. The amount of water that can be withdrawn from underground without jeopardizing future generations is only about 2.8 billion cubic meters per year. This refers to renewable groundwater, supplies that can be replenished naturally through rainfall absorption. Taking more than this would be unsustainable, as the reserves would not have time to recover. So-called fossil water is trapped within sandstone and limestone formations up to 300 meters thick, lying at depths of 150 to 1500 meters and stretching across thousands of square kilometers underground. Yet the Saudis still extract an average of 20 billion cubic meters of water per year from these sources, nearly seven times the sustainable limit. Since the 1980s, Saudi Arabia has been rapidly developing modern agriculture to provide its growing population with essential domestic food supplies. Oil revenues made it possible to green the desert and expand livestock farming. But once the true extent of the freshwater reserves became clear, the kingdom decided to abandon large-scale domestic wheat production. 
Instead, it now imports grain, soybeans, and beef from abroad, essentially practicing indirect water imports in the form of food products. Local farmers, meanwhile, have been shifted to greenhouse cultivation and modern drip irrigation systems. What other methods are there to obtain water? Naturally, by reusing wastewater that has been treated at purification facilities. As of 2019, 99 treatment plants across the country were producing 4.9 million cubic meters of treated water per day. It is projected that this figure will grow annually by about 4% until 2050. However, that still won't be enough because the population will continue to increase at the same pace. The overall picture is far from optimistic. So where else do Saudis get their water? Especially given that, on average, local residents consume more water than people in European countries. The answer is simple, from the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. Just imagine, in 2023, desalinated seawater accounted for 50% of all drinking water in Saudi Arabia. This supply comes from dozens of large desalination plants along the Persian Gulf coast, with the biggest one being Jubail Phase 2. This massive facility produces 365 million cubic meters of fresh water annually, making it the largest desalination plant in the world. It supplies not only the coastal cities of the Persian Gulf, but also Riyadh, located 400 kilometers inland in the heart of the desert. Today, Saudi Arabia has built 41 desalination plants along its coasts, securing its position as the world's leading producer of desalinated water. But the plants themselves are only part of the story. The state-owned Saline Water Conversion Corporation, responsible for desalinated water in the kingdom, has also built an artificial underground river in the form of a sprawling network of main pipelines. This colossal underground aqueduct spans a total length of 14,000 kilometers, transporting 20 million cubic meters of desalinated water across the Saudi desert every single day. If, as an experiment, all these pipelines were stretched out in a straight line, the resulting pipe would be twice as long as the Amazon, the longest river on Earth. Moreover, Saudi Arabia has set itself an ambitious goal to expand this pipeline network to 18,000 kilometers by 2030. The existing system already delivers water to virtually every corner of the country, and the investment is worth it. Saudis have gained access to an almost endless source of water, while the state has reduced its reliance on depleting underground reserves. On the other hand, desalination does require energy, about 6 kilowatt hours to produce 1 cubic meter of water. And despite this relatively modest figure, desalination plants already consume around 7% of the nation's total electricity. Of course, Saudi Arabia can afford to burn billions of cubic meters of gas to generate that power, but gas is also a valuable resource that could be sold abroad. That's why the country is implementing the National Water Saving Program, Katra, which means drop, and aims to reduce per capita fresh water consumption by 40% by 2030, down to 150 liters per person per day. The Saudis take a comprehensive approach to freshwater use and are also fighting desertification through large-scale greening projects. The goal of the Saudi Green Initiative is to protect 30% of the country's land area by implementing numerous environmental measures, including the planting of 450 million trees, which of course will also require fresh water to grow. Altogether, Saudi Arabia has planned to green 75 million hectares of land, this effort is expected to slow the advance of the desert, gradually transform barren lands into forest, steppe, and savanna, and expand the areas suitable for agriculture. But that is not the only objective. According to the plan, urban greening will also improve air quality and reduce average temperatures in city areas by at least 2.2 degrees Celsius. Between 2017 and 2023, 41 million trees were already planted, covering 17% of the kingdom's territory. Most of these positive changes have occurred in the northern regions, but by 2030, the entire map of Saudi Arabia is expected to look much greener, with 30% of the country placed under green protection. The capital, Riyadh, is not located in the north, but it has not been forgotten. In fact, it has its own dedicated project, Green Riyadh. Situated in the center of the Arabian Peninsula, the capital attracts about 5 million tourists each year, making it the 49th most visited city in the world. With a population of 7 million, Riyadh is also the third largest city in the Middle East and the 38th largest in Asia. One might think it would be a highly attractive place to live permanently, 
yet it does not appear on the lists of cities most sought after by people looking to relocate, mainly because of its harsh desert climate, where temperatures often soar above 35 to 40 degrees Celsius. To change this, the authorities have set an ambitious goal. Riyadh should enter the top 100 most livable cities in the world. The project envisions planting trees in gardens, parks, mosques, schools, universities, and medical facilities. By 2030, more than 7.5 million trees are expected to grow across the city, increasing green coverage from just 1.5% to 9%. Officials believe this will improve air quality, reduce CO2 concentrations by 6%, and lower average temperatures in the city's greenest areas. The Green Riyadh project is considered one of the most ambitious urban afforestation programs in the world. It includes the creation of the Sports Boulevard, which is set to become the longest linear park on the planet, as well as the monumental King Salman Park in the heart of the city. But beyond just the sheer scale, attention must also be given to the staggering total cost of $23 billion, making it one of the most expensive urban greening projects ever undertaken. That's all for today, friends. Don't forget to leave a like if you found this video interesting, share your thoughts in the comments, and see you next time.